the GenTech podcast discussing business, investing, and marketing. Hey guys, welcome back to the GenTech podcast, bringing you valuable and inspirational discussion with top business owners. Today we have on Cesar Hernandez, founder and CEO of OmniPublic. So really excited to talk to him today about his journey to becoming an entrepreneur. So Cesar, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. No, thank thank you to you for your time, um, to Amel and Christian for having me on. Of course. So first, I kind of want to just have the audience kind of get to know you and your background. So um, want to tell us a little bit about where you're from? Sure. Um, I guess the best way I could describe it is like the popular song, you know, I was born by the river and just like the river I've been running ever since. Uh, that river is the Hudson River, because I'm from Brooklyn, New York, a very small town, uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, but my family is from Guatemala, so they are from an indigenous tribe um, from El Quiche. So I like to say that my family traded the literal jungle for the concrete jungle. Mm-hmm. Um, but like all good New Yorkers, came to Florida, the sixth borough, of course. and um, here I am. So how does it feel to be first generation and especially first generation in a state like New York? For me, I find a tremendous amount of pride in me being a first generation from indigenous parents. Uh, you know, growing up, it's not something that people were proud about or even discussing it. I, think, I really feel that it's a lot more open with Indigenous Peoples Day and people are a bit more sensitive to Indigenous culture and people have gone through. Um, luckily, that's something that my grandmother consistently talked about was our Indigenous heritage, um, particularly my tribe is um, El Quiche. And for those history buffs, the Quiche Maya are, are the ones that dominated Mayan civilization. So when you see the temples in the Yucatan um, or in Tikal, uh, you know, that's my heritage. Um, sadly though, um, during, I want to say that my, my people probably struggled since 1492. And if you talk to them, they're still in the struggle, right? And so my great, great grandfather was fighting in the secret wars in Guatemala. Uh, so much so that he gave up his family to Catholic orphanages because he was afraid for his children. And then uh, my great great grandfather was then kind of raised in abject poverty in Guatemala City in legal slavery. And then my grandmother was raised in that environment. And so she was fighting politically. But politics in Latin America is very different, mm-hmm. right? So you think our politics is bad there. If you win or lose, sometimes people go missing. Um, And uh, my grandmother fought and started winning and her party won an election in the in the capital city. But the other side didn't like that. So her friends started going missing. Other party members started going missing. And that's when she hightailed it out of there and got to Brooklyn, New York. Wow. So do you really see your grandmother as an inspiration to you? Oh yeah, she's like four foot eleven and made of steel, right? Mm-hmm. She is probably the biggest inspiration in my life. I uh, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my grandmother. I wouldn't have the work ethic that I have if it wasn't for my grandmother. Uh, she always tells me that you know she doesn't have a big legacy to give me. Um, the best she could have done was that I could be born in this country and that I can have an education. And she's like, that is what I can give you. Um, And I never forgot that. And so that's why I'm super ambitious, super, maybe even super motivated uh, because I'm just hungry. Like I finally feel that for the first time in 400 years, like my family can think about thriving and not surviving. So since, you know, Europeans went into Latin America. My family has been literally struggling, trying to survive, trying to make it. But now I'm here and the mindset is different. So who am I not to kind of extrapolate everything and soak life up like a sponge? And when would you say that you had that transition from surviving to thriving? What was that turning point in your family? 
I, I would say I'm a late bloomer, right? I, I went back to school at 23, 23, 24 years old. And uh, it, it kind of hit me because, you know, I have a little bit of a colorful background being raised in Brooklyn. You know, today I do very well. I'm in a suit. But, you know, by the time I was 22, I had been arrested around six times, been shot at twice. And I got to a point where, uh, you know, through some accusations and through some something that I got involved with in protecting like a family member of mine, I ended up getting into like a fist the cuffs fight with police officers, right? And I was looking at aggravated assault on a police officer for 15 years. And that was a very scary moment for me because I was essentially on my way to Rikers Island. Um, and so being in Brooklyn, being in what we used to call the tombs, uh, which is central bookings, and then thinking, wow, like, am I really about to like, spend the next 15 years in a prison cell, mm -hmm. right? And I'm 22, 23 years old, like, my life is done. like. So, you know, having that moment of clarity, being in the tombs, not knowing what's gonna happen in my life. You know, sometimes when we don't have anywhere to look, we look up and we look up to God. And I just remember just praying and being like, man, Lord, like, I don't really talk to you a lot. But today, if you get me out of here, I'm gone. And, I think the Lord heard me in that tomb because uh, the next day the detective came up to my cell and just berated me, cursed me out, you know, started cursing me out, all those things. And then I just remember looking at him and telling him, look, you know what? I'm gonna face my responsibility, you know, so be it, and I apologize. And his demeanor changed, and he was like, you know what I'm gonna do? He's like, you're gonna plead guilty, I'm gonna let you go. Cause I saw the whole thing and I don't want to get into it because I know that we only have a, a limited amount of time but I've discussed it in other interviews he let me he essentially let me go drop charges and wow. so I went to the courthouse and I'm waiting to see the judge and he's like how do you plead and I was like guilty and like a, literally a little dude comes out from the side gives like the judge a paper the judge looks at it and he's like all right you're free to go and I'll just never forget the feeling of taking off those handcuffs and being let out in Red Hook. And three months later, I was in Tampa. Wow, so that was definitely a pivotal moment in your life that has really shaped you till now. Yes, and it's what's important is environment, mm -hmm. right? Because I still have the same mind of when I was in New York City. I still have the same work ethic but my environment wasn't conducive for growth. You know, like there's a statistic that most, you know, black or brown individuals have about a seven times more likeliness of being arrested. And I am legitimately hitting that statistic six times, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I knew that I just needed to get out of that because that environment, what it was gonna produce was not this. It was gonna produce something else. And it's kind of the reason why I think that there's that there's so much potential in these underprivileged areas that we're not really tapping into that can be tremendous con contributors to society, but they're just lost, you know? And they're in these environments that aren't enabling them to be contributors. I completely agree. I think environment is a huge part, you know, talking about just the trajectory of your life. So you came to Tampa and you know, what were your next steps after that? Man, I came to Tampa and number one, I think for me, Tampa's sacred. Mm -hmm. I love Tampa, I love Tampa Bay. And I enrolled in USF, right? So I went to education and initially it was biomedical science major, wanted to be a physician, right? And when I came to USF, I got super involved uh, specifically in a fraternity mm -hmm. and became president of that fraternity like within a year won every single award you could possibly imagine on campus um, and then 
decided that I wanted to run for student body president. And really running for student body president was probably the start of my professional career. Mm -hmm. um, in state university systems, when you become student body president, you're also a board of trustee member. So you're the final authority. So imagine I'm rolling around in a golf cart at USF and I'm legitimately the boss of these professors, right? Like, because I'm on the board of trustees. Yeah. So they will call me Trustee Hernandez. And you're sitting on a board with captains of industry. The only way you can get on the BOT is whether if the governor appoints you, you are like president of the university, student body president, or faculty president. That's it. Wow. So being able to be connected with those individuals at that time it carries over to this day, right? Because you're treat, you're under sunshine law, which means that, you know, you're an elected official, like you're a public official. Like I received taxes when I was through what's called an activity and service fee. So my budget as student government was like 18, 19 million, like something ridiculous. Wow. Like my salary was like 30K and I'm like a In college school. student, you mm -hmm. know, rolling around in a golf cart, right? So I loved living that campus experience flexing my professionalism and those relationships carry over to this day over 10 years later wow. right and so that was really the start of my career and um you know god bless usf because those professors enabled me with not the work ethic but the ability to flex my academic muscle and i always knew that i was intelligent but i didn't know i didn't know to what capacity until I started competing with other people, right? And then getting the grades, I became obsessed with learning. Like I would spend 14, 16 hours at uh, the library. I ended up triple majoring. I was biomed, poli sci, econ, wow. right? I was like, I go to med school, go to law school, I go to business school, I go to whatever <laughs> I want. And I just loved it. Like for me, learning is an obsession. Like most people want to go to school and get out. I want to go in, I want to get more. Mm -hmm. I want to learn more because intelligence is being able to map out the key components of learning. It's not just, I learned this, I regurgitated, gave me a degree. That's just knowledge. But intelligence is putting the knowledge to work. And that's marquee. Like if you can figure that out and synthesize it, you can transform society. And you've continued to learn, so can you tell our audience the degrees that you've gotten so far? Yeah, I, I, I went, um, you know, I almost feel reluctant sometimes to, to discuss it because I, I, I did it because I want to, whenever I go to certain institutions, because I want to, I want to learn from the source, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, my first foray into like high academia was I uh, got a, an, a, like a graduate certificate at uh, Harvard Business School for um, disruption theory, right? Um, then I went off in 2017 to do an MBA at Brown University with the concentration in uh, reflective leadership, which is like, how do you introduce like these new concepts and, and these ideas into a marketplace while being sensitive to the community, mm -hmm. right? And three months from graduation at Brown, um, I had launched my firm. And so I had to make a decision whether to make payroll or pay tuition. And I made payroll. And so I had put it on pause. Mm -hmm. And then when I went back, um, I was gonna go back and just finish like their version of thesis called um, Key Reflection Project. Um, a recruiter from Oxford was like, hey, we like the work that you're doing. You should consider Oxford. And I'm like, hey, I probably won't get in. You know, it's like three to 7% people get in. Mm -hmm. And the program that I was in only accepts 70 people a year. Wow. And it's dirt and it's, and it's not like just, it's not just the US, it's around 70 people a year from 35 countries. So it's a global cohort. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I just thought to myself, all right, well, I'm not going to get in, but typically got applied two to three times and maybe by the time I'm 45, I'll get in. Yeah. And so at the deadline of applying to Oxford, the day of the deadline, I submit. And then two weeks later, they're like, can you interview? And then I interviewed 
And they told me, would you interview again? I'm going to interview again. They're like, can you start in two months? And I was like, all right, now I got to pay for this. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, I wasn't expecting that. Mm-hmm. And then so I got in. And um, you know, the reason why I decided to go there was because of their learnings. They give you an executive coach. But they're working on the newest concepts in consulting, right? Which hopefully we can discuss here: systempreneurship, non-market strategy, um, and is which is essentially the future of consulting. And that knowledge is coming from that school. Mm-hmm. So if you want to learn from the source, I decided to go to the source. And it's fascinating because as I'm working on a lot of these things and I'm learning a lot of it, most people don't, like, they've never heard of it. Just like a lot of people haven't heard of, like, um, Clayton Christensen's disruption theory or, you know, now everybody's a disruptor, blah, 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 blah. And so some of the things that they're working on right now are going to become commonplace and I'm learning it now in real time. And who's benefiting from it right now are, like, my clients. And I have, like, this intimate knowledge and intelligence on how to make these applications. Yeah, so how have you really been able to use that education to kind of set you apart from competitors, especially in Florida? Yeah, absolutely. So, right, depending on who you speak to, like they'll say, oh, I know Caesar, he's a lobbyist. Oh, hi, I know Caesar, he's a publicist, Mm -hmm. right? Or he's a consultant. And then the reality is, is that I'm all these things, but that discipline of all these things Um, is called uh, systempreneurship, right? And so I'll explain a 30,000 foot level systempreneurship is, and then I'll give you a case study on a client, right? So systempreneurship is the movement of movements. And it's how an individual can be a chief orchestrator of multiple systems, right? Interdependent of each other, but moving them in a specific direction to achieve a specific objective, Mm -hmm. right? And I'll give you an example. So the scooters, right? So Bird Rides was my client. I introduced the concept of micromobility to the state of Florida, right? So God bless everybody jumps on a scooter because I designed that system, right? Specifically um, how it made it legal for the state of Florida, but then also for cities. Now, how did I do that? When I was trying to implement that technology, I wasn't just navigating the government, right? Because that's a system. Mm -hmm. I was navigating the political arena, right? So the outgoing mayor as well as the incoming mayor, right? I also had to work with media and work on the public opinion so that individuals want to be receptive of the technology. I also had to work with community organizations that were gonna see scooters being dumped on the street, right? So the civic associations and the informal leaders, right? That's an example of me and my team navigating multiple systems and pointing them in a direction so that people can jump on scooters. So if I just did one of those things, Mm -hmm. if I just made it legal, the media and the community may have just gone up against it. But if I'm maneuvering all of them to that in one goal. harmony, then that's a difference maker, right? Mm-hmm. And so you want someone that understands how to navigate these arenas for the benefit of your objective. And that's where we're at. And my specific expertise within that, it's what's, what's called uh, non-market strategy. And so the best way to describe that is like a marketer is working within the parameters of a market. This is a marketer. Mm -hmm. Hey, these are the levers to push to market your widget product idea. And I'm an expert in marketing this, right? But what about when a market doesn't exist, right? So non-market strategy, what you do is, is you're essentially creating the rules of a new market so that others can participate in it, but you create the real the rules such that you are the incumbent from the start because you're designing it, right? And that's non-market strategy. And so my clients, right, they're always introducing something new that that doesn't have a market. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're market adjacent. So think scooters, Hyperloop, Tesla, flying cars, 
right? There isn't a market. I'm helping to find those markets for my clients, right? Some of my clients are working on cancer vaccines. Some are doing VR for medical surgical procedures, right? Um, and they trust me and they rely on me because I, I know how to essentially create markets for them on their behalf and navigate multiple arenas on their behalf. Yeah, that sounds incredible and that you're able to really bring your knowledge from Oxford to Florida and all these companies that you're working with. And all the companies you named are very big names. So when you were first starting out, like how did you, you know, get in contact with these big companies and how did you really grow your business? I did my research, right? Uh, so with Tesla, for example, I read, this is 2016, right? So mm -hmm. not, not like a big deal, but when I reached out to them, they were kind of like starting. Mm -hmm. And I read Elon Musk's, um, you know, everybody's reading his book. I was reading his master plan. Like, what is his company trying to do? Mm -hmm. And how can I align myself with what he wants? And in that master plan, what he wrote was Tesla originally wanted to do a rideshare company. Um, so imagine you have a Tesla, it's autonomous, you're sleeping, it leaves and goes make money for you. Picks people up, picks people up, wow. ching, 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 mm -hmm. comes back in the morning, you just made money because <laughs> it was self-driving. Mm -hmm. That was their ambition for their self-driving project was to create the Tesla network. And so what I pitched them was to partner with the government agency and then create a ride share with Tesla and then be able to see if their vehicles are going to be able to sustain themselves for 24 hours, mm -hmm. right? And it worked. They worked with the transit agency here. We, I don't know if you remember, they used to be Tesla's downtown, picking people up, um, called a downtowner. Mm -hmm. And then uptown, there was one called Hyperlink. So I helped design those systems, wow. right? And what ended up happening was they took that model that started here in Tampa and now, if you go to New York City, there's a rideshare company called Revel, or they use Tesla. If you hail a Uber out in Europe, like in Madrid, mm -hmm. a black Tesla pulls up. So they took a lot of these things that like I helped create, mm -hmm. and they just kept building upon it. And sadly, we didn't benefit from it because it just took the the learnings and just did it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But what I did was I knew that he wanted to do this. And then I pitched Tesla, and then I pitched their um, uh, like chief business development person at the time, and I also reached out to their lobbyist at the time up in Tallahassee, because I knew that he had an in with BizDev, since government relations works intimately with BizDev, mm -hmm. and he was like, I would put you in contact with them, that's cool, so shout out to the lobby corps that they are always looking out for each other, and then I got in front of them. And that's what I would always do. Mm -hmm. Bird rides. I pitched them to pay me to introduce themselves into Florida. Right. So I was like, you should do this. You should pay me. And this is the way you should do it. So I just leave it open for like who I want to work with. Mm -hmm. And I just research where they want to be and what they want to do. And I just pitch them. So why do companies need public relations and what value do you really bring to these companies? So. PR is essential component to any company because it's communications, right? Specifically in tech, it's important. And most of my clients come to me one of three reasons. Number one, they just raised a round. And so when you raise a round and say you raise 150 million, 100 million, what you put out is so important because if a reporter gets it wrong, they can throw off a valuation, they can turn off investors, mm -hmm. and then you can never you have something out there digitally that you can never remove. So how you communicate these very sensitive things is essential and you want an expert, you don't want somebody making stuff up. Right? So that's the first thing. Number two, they have a novel concept, they have some brand new widget, they have a brand new app. They want people to understand it. They want them to use it. You know, I'm an appendage of marketing, right? So if you want to be able to describe your widget 
properly mm -hmm. and be able to enter a market properly or as i mentioned before you're creating a new market you need the proper messaging strategy because if you don't have it and an article comes out that misrepresents your value proposition then you have something out there that you're going to have to try to triage right and the next thing is my clients typically are in a super saturated market and they want to make noise. They want to stand out. They want hard credibility indicators like Forbes Inc., Entrepreneur, TechCrunch, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg's of the world, right? Because if you're super saturated and there's no difference between you or another business owner, but then you have the credibility indicators to signal, hey, yeah, we do the same thing, but I'm better. And here's why. You know, so typically it's either super saturated there isn't a market and they they need help with that or they have very sensitive messaging or a crisis communications that they need help with and you want an expert on your side doing that and you said you started on the public back in 2016 2017 mm -hmm. so how have you really seen the media change since you know you started that's a really good question the media has transformed um social media is the new media right mm -hmm. so you'll see um editors that they may have a really good column but then they shift the content over to linkedin or instagram or twitter spaces mm -hmm. and then they engage with their community on a on a separate platform so social media is an extension and is now actually becoming the new media um, the next thing is newsletters newsletters which have specific followers and specific readership are overtaking columns because most people are looking to consume newsletters because they can get the tidbits of information that they need and click on what they want right and then the last thing is um tv is changing right most people aren't watching tv as much anymore so a lot of these tv stations are starting to go virtual right and they're no longer doing these long newscasts, but what they're doing is they're creating these reels so that people can consume the reels mm -hmm. or they'll go live on interviews. And that becomes a lot more prominent than like, hey, here's my three minute VOSA or like, here's my three minute feature on, on a specific um, TV platform. The value of TV right now is morning shows, right? If you wanna do something, you wanna do morning shows specifically local morning shows because people are listening watching in the morning as opposed to say throughout the day or in the afternoon or a secret is if you want to get on the media and it's local pitch your story to the as a weekend segment mm -hmm. and if they film it on friday they typically keep filming it throughout the weekend so you get a bunch more airtime than as if you didn't do it previously and how do you keep up with these industry updates and trends that are happening and what advice would you have to you know other business owners who are trying to keep up with um, new trends and updates in their industry I mean, it's difficult i mean for me it's my industry and i'm obsessed with consulting so i'm always like i'm always reading writing and speaking like all day long right uh language conversations like i'm consistently doing that but what i would suggest is if you want to stay on top of like what media is doing is create a list of three to four local publications that you should be skimming through daily and see where they're pointing towards so i'll give you an example what i do like my my kind of like daily for tampa bay is um the axios newsletter right so i sign up to axios and they do really good aggregates of like different different stories um biz journal specifically tampa bay you know and their newsletter because they're strictly tech right um st p catalyst because they also cover broader community stories like art and artists and creatives um and then i would either go to florida politics because i just know what policy is happening what's happening with legislative affairs and then i would skim sometimes i don't even read the tampa bay times like i'm sorry they just haven't gotten they're just not 
where they used to be mm -hmm. and they're not covering tech, which is like what I'm interested in, right? So I'll skim TBT and 82 Degrees Media for community stuff. So that's seven, but I'm just skimming wow. locally, <laughs> skimming, skimming, skimming. But notice what they're doing. Axios is newsletters, so they push people to a newsletter, not site. So that's a broader signal that they're moving in the direction of a newsletter first, mm -hmm. right? Biz Journal is doubling down on tech, so they have a tech column. So you know that tech is becoming important in Tampa. Um, Florida Politics is starting to do podcasts, right? So now you're seeing that they're shifting over into like more of a podcast realm um, and expanding like their their offerings. Um, and another thing that I that I thought was um, was really cool that uh, that that was new was um, Biz Journal is also starting to do podcasts with like titans of industry, right? Like people that you would typically want to have access to. Mm -hmm. So notice that I'm consuming it, but I'm seeing what they're doing. They're shifting to newsletter, they're shifting to podcast, and they're shifting to social, right? And so that tells me that like their motherships are saying, this is where we need to start investing in because this is what people are consuming. Mm -hmm. And it's true, right? So, um, you know, newsletters are selling like the hustle sold to HubSpot, right? Axios, short format, smart brevity sold to Cox Media for like $500 million, right? So it's also verified that like, this is the new wave in mm -hmm. media. And you're very involved in the community, whether that's Tampa or Florida, and how do you think that's beneficial to you as a business owner? I would say it's, it's more of um, gratifying to me, mm -hmm. right, to be active, like I'm active. Uh, I was president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce, right? Um, super active at USF and the Latino Institute there. Uh, it's just a way of me giving my expertise to organizations and giving back to the community through my knowledge, right? And so does it translate into business? More often not, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't really. But, you know, I think that as, as a leader, you know, you have to be able to not just lead yourself your family, right, your company, but then your community, right? So those are like pillars or spheres of influence that you should constantly be focusing on is, you know, how can I be the best person possible? How can I be the best person and take care of my family? How can I be the best leader in, in my business? And then how can I take care of my community, right? So those are the spheres of influence that I focus on. And when thinking about Omni Public, what was your really your mission at the beginning, and where do you think that mission and vision has grown now? Yeah. For me, Omni Public was always supposed to be and is a place to represent the brightest minds in the world that are working on the greatest initiatives in the world and that are partnered with kind of the brightest people in the world. So bright individuals transforming society right, working with other bright individuals. And so I wanted a revolving door of journalists, right, um, of public officials, right, and of consultants. And the reason why I say revolving door because I want to, to con the ideas to be fresh, right? So if you look at uh, Omni Public, you know, some of our publicists were formerly with like TechCrunch, Bloomberg, the New York Times, right? And then they'll come in and do a tenure for a year, two years, work on amazing projects, and then go off and work for like a Yahoo News, right? So Garen, for example, the former producer for, no, the current producer for Yahoo News was formerly with Omni Public as a consultant, right? Came in, worked on accounts, and now he's working at a much larger platform, right? Um, we had a, a journalist turned publicist, Alan Cohn, and now, is the Democratic nominee for Congress, right? And he did a tenure with us, worked on amazing projects. Now he's off and run for Congress, right? Mike Suarez, former chair of the city council, or, you know, went from public official, is consulting with us now and working on some amazing projects, right? So you see how they're bringing intimate knowledge from government relations, from journalism, coming into Omni Public, uh, essentially giving their knowledge, working on amazing accounts all over the world, doing a tenure, 
producing outcomes and then going back out, continuing their careers, but it's always an opening, right? Mm -hmm. So we've had our first um, boomerang, whereas we hired a former um, industry dive editor and she also wrote at the next web and TechCrunch, worked with us, went to work for a big deal tech company, I won't say who, after a year then came back. But now she came back with these new ideas, mm -hmm. right? And, and contacts in Silicon Valley. So that's really the purpose of OmniPublic, is really just to help transform society through our clients. And you're talking about those like sustained relationships, you know, keeping those um, relationships at USF and in your company. And how do you think that has really benefited you, you know, keeping in touch with um, all of these individuals that, you know, maybe later in life you can help them, they can help you. How does that really help? So, I don't know if you know, but the first lady of Tampa, Anna Cruz, right, also like a titan in, you know, the legislative affairs world has worked with probably every single person that ran for president since the 90s, right? And came through Florida. She always says something. She goes, you never know who your boss is going to be. Mm -hmm. And that's somebody of her caliber saying that, right? So you never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you're going to be working with in the future. So you always kind of be genuine, right? And beyond. And I've always listened to when Anna says that, and I'm like, she's so true. Because, for example, right, you know, I may work with a political candidate that's running for school board now, but has become a state senator, mm -hmm. right? And that relationship carries over, or ran for city council and became a state rep, or ran for mayor and then became a, a, con a member of Congress. Right. So you never know. Um, and it's because people move throughout their career and they, they're going to rely upon those relationships. So another example is uh, the former, uh, you know, comms VP at USF became the editor in chief at Florida Trend. Right. And then she would call me and say, hey, I need I need legitimate stories and I trust you. Right. Mm -hmm. To give me legitimate stories. And that's a relationship. Right. But I've known her for 10 years, right? So that's how being super activated and participating in the community, but genuinely can lead to good outcomes, right? So me, I'm about genuine relationships. Some people are about transactional, and that's okay to say that's wrong, but I value genuine relationships in the long run. Definitely. And, you know, listening to you speak, it kind of, makes me think of this question. Do you really think entrepreneurs are born or bred? Like, do you think that, you know, you were really born to be an entrepreneur or you really worked your way to it and, you know, anyone can do that? You know, I would say that entrepreneurs are born. It's a calling. Because it sucks sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? And you either got it or you don't and i used to want to be the give you the most idealistic question like mlk and say things like everyone can serve and everyone can be great but that's not the truth is there's something distinctive about entrepreneurship that you love the struggle and you may complain about it but you wouldn't be doing anything else you know, mm -hmm. and it takes something different. Like I remember uh, we had an intern and the intern like followed me for like a week. I was like, I want to do this. Like, I want to be a consultant. And, you know, I was going up to Tallahassee lobbying. I would come back here, lobby. I would go into studios with clients. I would go to events at night. Right. I would have to like drive down in the middle of the night to Miami, work on an account, come back the next day. And the intern quit. <laughs> and was like, man, this is a lot. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what you do. And to me, I didn't realize I was doing that much because I love it. Like mm -hmm. I am obsessed with my clients and I'm obsessed with consulting. And so I didn't realize that until you put 
entrepreneurs and like what they love to do with someone else that just kind of maybe just wants the glamour mm -hmm. and then they're like no this isn't worth it like just give me a salary so i think that entrepreneurs are special um but what makes us special is that we're very comfortable in discomfort and that we secretly love that discomfort um and wouldn't be doing anything else is that what you mean by loving the struggle correct yeah correct and you know, I have a lot of clients and they always say the same thing is, either, is, you know, it's not about making money. Like if you know how to make money, you can always make money, but it's about loving to build something, to create something, to see it work, right? It's the spirit of entrepreneurship. It's like seeing it working properly. And then, you know, resources and money is a byproduct of this entity that you created. Like we're like artists, right? Our mm -hmm. canvas is the market. And that is what is unique and special about entrepreneurs. So what kind of clients is really like your target audience for Omni Public? Yeah, my, my target audience are typically tech, right? Startups, uh, institutions or academic institutions, right? And government agencies. Um, specifically within the realm of tech, transportation, mobility, and like social equity. So I've represented USF, right? I've represented big name brand, big box tech companies like Tesla, but I've also represented over 200 startups, right? That have had two founders working out of a closet, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, but what I'm always looking for is someone who's introducing a new concept or an idea into the marketplace, and they're looking to navigate media, government, and industry. And so if that's you, or if that's something that you need, you know, somebody like myself to work on on your behalf, then you're my, my guy or gal. And I want to ask, how do you define or measure success for yourself or for your company? For me, the way that I measure success is number one, if we produced, right? Um, I can build hours all day long, right? But did you get the media placement? Did we change laws for you? Did we change public opinion for you, right? Did we move the needle? Um, and I am obsessed with producing for my clients. I take it personal. Mm -hmm. Like my average contract is 27 months and we go month to month. Wow. Um, so when somebody leaves within a year, I take it personal. Cause I'm like, this is like not normal. Mm -hmm. Like what happened? What did we not do? How can we triage this? Like, how do we think about this? How do we produce a, a paramount product? So that's how my success is production for the accounts. And I know that you have been gaining all this knowledge and, you know, continuously learning and growing. And if someone asked you to write a book right now, what would you write it about? I would write the book on essentially how to, how to shape a market for your idea, right? And it would be around the concepts that I discussed in non-market strategy and assistive entrepreneurship, right? Nowadays, in order to introduce something, especially within tech, it always bumps with policy. It always bumps with media. There are these non-market factors within society, within politics, within culture, that as you're working on your widget, you may not think about until you're ready to introduce. And so I wanna discuss all these other variables that affect an enterprise that most people don't talk about. And what methods do you really use to promote your business with social media and marketing? So you know, we do uh, some social media, right, newsletters, but the biggest thing, honestly, has been word of mouth. Right. We have some marquee partnerships with accelerators and incubators all over the world. Right. Um, in Charlotte, in New York, in Tampa, in Miami, in London, 
uh, in LA, in Austin, that allow us to get in front of the people that we need to get in front of. And it's been word of mouth. Um, but soon that's about to change because there's a really good marketing company called Gentech Marketing <laughs> that we're probably going to be working with. Awesome. And I just want to ask one last question. What's the biggest takeaway that you hope our listeners learn today from this podcast? I would say that the number one thing, if you know, you can get anything out of this conversation, is essentially that do not allow um, other individuals or an environment manifest what you want for your life. I took a very non-traditional route, right? Like I thought that I wanted to be a physician. I thought that I wanted to be a lawyer and then I didn't either. Mm -hmm. And I went into consulting because I found like my passion. And as, as long as you're working on your passion and your mission, the byproduct is, you know, money, is wealth, is joy, because you're doing something that you're passionate about, that you're mission driven. And so when you fail, you're failing at something that you want to bring to this world. And you can look back and say, well, I tried or I did it. And so don't be defined for what other people want on your life. Go after it, right? right? Like this kid from Brooklyn, that my first college course was arithmetic because I took remedial math mm -hmm. in college. And then my last college course was fuzzy logic at Oxford. If I can go from Birmingham Community College to like Oxford, like high education, you know, anybody can, can achieve it. Well, Caesar, thank you so much. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you online? Sure, you can find me on Instagram, Caesar Hernandez uh, Prime, uh, or you can also email me, ch at omnipublic.global. And you can find us at, at Gentech Marketing on all social media platforms. Thank you for listening. We'll see you guys next week.